Well, amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be saved, right? Good to be in church, right? Good to see me, right? I tried to slip that one in, you know. It is good to be saved, guys. Always good to be saved. And it is good to be here. We were in Boise, and uh, the, the, the awning collapsed on my trailer because of the uh, snow. It was 11 below zero. And, we, and, you know, Detroit, I mean, we do Detroit next week, and I've always used uh, my four-wheel drive on my truck just to get from the motel to the, to the church. And, it, and Kathy looks on the phone and said, it's 55 in Detroit. I said, head for the plane. <laughs> but it is good to be here. It really is. Uh, I want you to open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes. That's uh, right after Genesis. Ecclesiastes, we're going to study, study. And I didn't uh, stutter, stutter. What I mean is that we're going to study the word study. It appears only three times in Scripture, so this will only take two hours. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 12, it says, And further by these, my son, be admonished, of making many books there is no end. I can say amen to that one. Uh, And much study is a weariness of the flesh. I could say amen to that one. Uh, You know, it's amazing. Uh, You talk to anybody about studying the Bible or study. That's that's the verse they quote. You know, there's a couple of verses in the Bible. Now, when I say a couple, I don't mean two. I mean, there's there's like a small group of them. Everybody knows them. Uh, Every every wino in town knows, uh, well, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. These guys got the worst stomachs in the world, do they not? Uh, and if you say anything about anything being wrong, everybody knows, judge not. The Bible says judge not. I was witnessing to a guy one time. <laughs> I was at his house. I can't even remember what we were talking about, but whatever it was, uh, I know it's probably hard for you to believe that I could be opinionated. Um, but he said something. You know, he wasn't, I wasn't disagreeing with him. We, we brought up a subject, and I said, well, that's bad. And he goes, judge not. The Bible says judge not, and you're judging. And I said, Am I wrong for judging? He said, yes. I said, quit judging my judging. (laughs) Isn't it amazing, you know, that how many people say judge not and they'll say you're wrong for judging? If you believe judge not, you can't say somebody's wrong for judging because you're judging to say it. And and they are the most judgmental people there are. (laughs) And this one, uh, this one is one that Christians use. As soon as you say you ought to study your Bible, well... Much study is the weariness of the flesh. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You guys remember that stuff? I remember Greek, man. I'd be studying Greek like, uh, you know, at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning. I tell people, I said, I learned about 1 o'clock in the morning studying Greek participles that insanity has a door. And I opened it up. And I know you won't believe this, but I did not go through... <laughs> There, there are some folks who would dispute that, but, um, but they're, you know, you say, and I, well, so what? Study is a, you know, study is a weariness of the flesh. That's the first time it's used in the Bible. Guys, anything you want to do well involves study. Isn't that right? Uh, would you like musicians to come up here who never studied music? Because if you do, I will play you a special. <laughs> and it'll, uh, it's, it's going to be sweet hour of prayer because that's what you're going to find yourself doing. <clears throat> when I pray, I, you know, I always like those people, again, that's those people that never do anything, can't carry two, hit two notes right side by side, and then they go, well, you know, the Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I want to say, could you make it out there? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're allowed to practice, you're allowed to carry a tune, but, but really, I bet some of you, you people who are musical, I'll bet you remember your music lessons, and were you not tired of that? Ding, 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 ding. That's all I can play. I mean, if Chopsticks had Christian words, I could do a special. But what I'm saying is anything you want to do involves some study. You know, they say, what was it? Who was it? Who's the guy that just retired from football, the quarterback, the real good one? Indianapolis. He was in Indianapolis. Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning. They said that, that he would, for hours and hours and hours before a game, he would study uh, movies of the team they're going to play. And he would study their plays. He would study how they covered their receivers. It wasn't just, he said, well, a guy's got natural talent. I imagine he did have natural talent, but he also studied. 
and he probably would not be possibly one of the greatest quarterbacks or one of the greatest quarterback in, in football if he had not spent time studying. And when people say study is a weariness of the flesh, you know what I think they mean? I don't want to study the Bible anyway. And then they'll go on and study some of, something else. Let me ask you a question. Would you like to have open heart surgery by somebody that's never studied? Well, I want to try this. Yeah, when I was just the other day, when I was working at the old change place, I said, I think I can do that. I mean, what's the difference between a ticker and a car? I mean, I, would you like brain surgery done by somebody who has never studied? You talk to you. Know, I, I'm sorry. Look, I know that you can take vitamins, and I know that there's some things. You know, everybody bad mouth um, um, uh, doctors, <clears throat> except for yours. Yours, I know, is a good man. But um, I always have to laugh because they have the only good doctor in the world. All doctors are criminals except my doctor. Yeah, and all senators are bad except yours, and all public schools are bad except yours. And, and here's the thing, guys. I mean, you ought to talk to somebody who is a doctor and see what they put in in study and see what they have to do to pass their exams to practice medicine. And then, and then you get this Christian who reads a three-page three article in Prevention Magazine, and they know more. I'm sorry, guys, I am not putting my health in your hands. I'm not wearing your clove of garlic or your magnet in my back pocket or whatever else magic it is. Um, but, guys, there is, there is some study to be done. Uh, you know why our military is so good? You know what many guys have said in the military? They said, we practiced and rehearse things so much that when we get into the battle, it's not as tough as the training. That's study. And why would a Bible believer go to this verse to be irresponsible toward their Bible and then study something else? I know, guys, look, there's nothing wrong with golfing, okay? I mean, if you saw me golf, you'd understand why it's a four-letter word. But... Um, but guys, uh, a guy will stand, he'll, he'll go down the, the driving range and practice driving. Isn't that study? See where it lands? Man, I, we, I Star Trek golf. I hit the ball, and then we go where no man has ever gone before. I am pretty sure, I will not tell this, but I'm pretty sure I found Jimmy Hoffa. You know, we, uh, we've been on the road for 30 years, <clears throat> and, and I had somebody ask me, they said, what changes have you seen in, in our churches? Not many Bible-believing churches every week. Uh, and they said, what changes have you seen in our churches? And, and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to get you by anything. I'm really not. Uh, but I said, you know what's happened in our churches, churches like this one? People quit buying Bible commentaries. You say, well, why would that be? Well, it used to be this. I love the Bible. Here's a Bible commentary about the Bible. I think I'll buy it and learn something about the book that I love. But even in our churches, this purpose-driven philosophy, which is it's all about me and what's this going to do for me and how is it going to help me and how am I going to get through my depression and how am I going to get through being, uh, you know, discriminated against and, and uh, you know, uh, isolated and I just don't feel good about myself. That's what all that stuff is. It's all horizontal. <clears throat> and so even in our churches, when you look at a book... You, you say, what's it going to do for me? And so you look at a Bible commentary and say, well, all I'm going to do is no more Bible. How's that going to help? That's, how's it going to help my marriage? And so, guys, yes, study. I will tell you, study. Study is a weariness to the flesh. You know, I probably told you this. <clears throat> um, I like the Brits. I do. I like the British. But, you know, there is, there's, you know what's more boring than a British author? I mean, I like the Brits, but I, I've, I've said this before. They can put you to sleep reporting on a house fire. I say, don't fall. <laughs> Give that microphone to an American and we will make a movie. <laughs> oh, the flames are leaping into the sky. Women are fainting. Babies are crying. I mean, oh, it was just a grill. But... That's an American. We will make a movie out of this, will we not? And you ever read a British author? They, it should be illegal to write books if you are a British author. But you know what's more boring than a British author? A century-old British author. And, and studying Greek manuscripts, I, have, I, I, can, I can guarantee you on three occasions, 
I can name the books. It was kind of like, you know, how could you remember the name of those books? Do you remember where, where you were when the towers fell? Yeah, see, those massive tra tragedies, you always remember where you were. And on, on three occasions, it's a thousand pages, two volumes, written around 1871, and they're telling, and they're telling you about Greek manuscripts, that's boring enough. And I, one guy had a, he had one paragraph, four and a half pages long. I think you should go to jail <laughs> for having paragraphs that are four and a half pages long. I really do. <clears throat> you say, well, is it boring? Yeah. You know, I get a lot of people that go, how do you travel and write? I said, I don't have a good golf swing. That's it. You study what you want, I'll study what I want. But the fact is, guys, yes, it is a weariness of the flesh. Uh, and you get tired. And and whatever you like, and don't ever say, because all you people that say about not studying the Bible, studies the weariness of the flesh, you study something. Ladies, ladies, I don't, would we want the first cake you baked? Would we want to eat the first one you baked? It's probably a doorstop somewhere. <laughs> it's probably at the end of an anchor chain of a boat somewhere. Does not absorb water, and it stops that boat right now. But you study. And so, guys... Uh, we, we are admonished to study, and, yet, and the reason I'm giving this verse first, because I know as soon as I say study, somebody's mind, well, study, study is the weird news of the flesh. So what? That's how you get good at something. That's how you learn about something. Isn't that true? So, yes, study is the weirdness of the flesh. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, it's not like you didn't know this verse was in the Bible. But it says, <clears throat> verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Is that an admonition by your, your Savior and your God to study his book? You know, I, um, I, I know this dates me, but that's okay. A bunch of you are with me. I'm from the Beatles generation. Guys, you know, you know how you know you're old? When Beatles music has become easy listening. <laughs> you know, they, I, I am sure, I was lost when they came to the States, and I am sure that preachers all across the country were preaching how evil and wicked the Beatles were, and I think, I look back and I realize that, yes, they were. They probably, you know, they sang those evil songs like, I want to hold your hand. Oh. These guys out there now, they're singing, I want to cut it off and eat it. And, and do you guys remember, you know, of course now, you know, some of the younger guys won't remember this, but remember records? No, I'm not talking about what the police kept on you. I had those too. But um, I'm talking about those round black pieces of plastic with grooves in them. And, and somebody said this, if you play a Beatles album backwards, there are hidden messages. And I'm sorry, I just see a bunch of doofuses. You know how you play a record backwards? You got to spin it backwards. <laughs> I'm listening for the message. I did. I got to admit it. I did it. I did it. I heard a message. You know what it said? You're a quiet. Yeah. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, they're Chinese spies. <laughs> Death to America. I heard it myself. I know that must be what they said in Chinese. Guys, I mean, you know what I think? I think you want to study turning a record backwards to hear some, some hidden message like Paul is dead and he still doesn't know it. <laughs> and, and guys, you know, think about some of the stuff that you do study that is absolutely worthless. Well, I studied this and I got a trophy and you'll take it to heaven with you, right? Won't do anything. Let me ask you a question. Do you, um, do you believe this book is deeper than the page? Yeah. So why wouldn't you want to find out what's in it? Let me tell you about a, uh, this fellow was a doctor. He's an anesthesiologist. He's a pastor now. And he got saved by accident. He went to this Presbyterian church, and he couldn't hear the gospel there. And, uh, and, he, and he got saved. <clears throat> and he was, but he was, because he was saved, he knew a little Bible. He got into his Bible, got excited. So they, they made him a Sunday school teacher. He did not know any better. So he was, he was teaching his Sunday school class, and he was studying seven, seven different versions of the Bible he would study his lesson in. 
Now, that's six more than you need if you got the right one. I understand that. But you understand that he didn't know that. Uh, and so he had a King James and six other modern translations. And he's, uh, he's studying his lesson. And one day he said this to his wife, because he's a King James Bible believer. And he said, I, I said to my wife, come here and look at this. And he, he said, now look at this verse. And she looked at that verse. He said, now, you know what's amazing about that verse? And he goes back to another reference. And he says, look how it, how it interlocks with this verse back here. And she goes, why, it does, doesn't it? He goes, well, wait a minute, wait. And, and look how those two go along with this verse. She said, that's something. He goes, wait. And he, showed, he said, and those three, uh, this one is, it goes, right. She goes, that's true. She says, that's amazing. He said, that's not amazing. He said, what's amazing is it only does it in this one that's called the King James. He said, when I check these verses in a modern translation, they don't mesh. And he threw out the other six. He didn't get here from Ruckman or Gip or anybody else. He got it from God. You wouldn't believe this, but I tell people with NIVs, you know what I tell them? You say, tell them to get rid of them. No, I don't. I tell them to read them. You would be, you'd be shocked how many, how many people have called me over the years and said, you know how I got on the King James Bible? I said, how? They said, I read the modern translation I had. And about the second time through, they went, there's something wrong here. And they ended up here. Guys, you know, you are admonished to study this book. Now, let me speak to the men, okay? I don't want to speak to the men because, now, ladies, don't get mad. I've said this before. Women say some stupid things. <laughs> most of you women remember the most stupid thing you said in your life. I do. <laughs> and men say some stupid things. Some of you men <clears throat> possibly remember the dumbest thing you ever said. Will you, will you please? Anyway, um... <laughs> But you know what the difference is between a woman saying something stupid and a man saying something stupid? When a woman says something stupid, it's evident that fast, and then everybody gets a chuckle. You know, it's all L-O-L. <laughs> I mean, we were, we were someplace, you know, and uh, at this pastor, we just got in for a meeting, and this, this, his wife is saying, well, I just don't understand. He wrecked our car, and next day I wrecked our van, and next day they canceled our insurance. I said, well, you think they saw a trend? And she goes, oh, so, so a woman says something stupid, everybody gets a laugh. Only a man can say something stupid and think it is oracle. <laughs> a man will say something stupid and think that it should be etched in granite and memorized by children. Only, women don't do this. Men say stupid things and finish with, huh? <laughs> right there. I mean, that's what they do. Uh, and I get men, you know, I'm always telling people, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. And then I get these men, they come up and they go, you know, I read my Bible. And then I started noticing this verse and I, I started studying here and I started studying there. And, you know, pretty soon I studied my Bible and didn't have time to, to read. And they think they're saying something smart. And I'm waiting for the, huh? <laughs> you say, why? That's stupid. If somebody takes you out for a steak dinner, do you study it? Brother, I don't, ooh, I wonder if this is a Hereford or a Black Angus. It's a dead cow. And it died in vain unless you start cutting and chewing, okay? You know, I tell people, I said, don't study your Bible when you're reading. I mean, when you, when you sit down to eat, you, it's not study time. You, you don't study the meal, you eat the meal. But I did do this. I wanted to know where all them parts came from, all right? I mean, I could figure out ribs and rump roast. I got those two down brisket, anything that good. Listen, I don't know, I didn't know where it came from. All I knew was they need to breed a cow with 18 briskets and a chicken with 18 legs. And, um, and so I looked, I got this picture of a dotted cow. I call, it, I call it the dotted line cow and it's got all these sections off and it says this word. And I found out, briskets, good stuff. I had somebody ask me one time, said, every cow tongue. I said, you know how much, how many parts on a cow you can eat where you got to get to the tongue? I, I start somewhere on a hind quarter, and I'm full way before I get near that tongue. If it don't, I'm sorry, you can eat all the cow tongues. You can have all the cow tongues from the cows that I get. If it doesn't have a bone shaped like a T, I am not interested. My cows look like this. But here's what I'm telling you. I eat my meal. Then I studied it at a different time. I, and I get people ask me a lot of times, how do I study my Bible? And, and it is not profound at all. 
Now, this is a prayer list, <clears throat> but um, uh, I get a piece of paper that, that is out of my notebook. I still use a notebook. Yes, I still use a day timer. Say why? Batteries never go dead, and I can, I can use it below 10,000 feet. But um, I get a piece of paper like that, and I put a subject on it. Uh, you like what? Oh, like uh, italicized words. And then about four or five times through my Bible, every time I come to a verse that I think is pertinent to that study, I put the verse. And after about four or five times, I, I think I probably arrived at it. You know, I got a book out there on uh, verses composed of single syllable words. Try to, try to find that one with your Bible program, bucko. I mean, you're not going to find that on your Bible program. Say, how do you do it? I set my mind as I read my Bible to have it say, whoa, that one's single syllable words. It was uh, three years, 10 times through the Bible. I found 916 of them. It was a bunch of these pieces of paper. But I, so while I'm reading, I write down the references that I want to check later. And then when I get done, you wouldn't believe how many little envelopes I have of, uh, of things like this with words all over them that are for future studies that, that I laid out the groundwork years ago. And so when I get done with that study, I put it aside, put it in an envelope, uh, title it, but I read my Bible. Guys, you ought to study this book. You ought to be interested in this book. You say, well, I am interested in it. No, you're not. You're interested in the Super Bowl. You're interested in being successful. Uh, you're interested in whatever. I'll tell you what you're interested in. You're interested in what you're studying. I mean, if you're studying how to kill a deer, hey, man, kill a deer, I don't care. I, I don't know, you know, I go out at 3 o'clock in the morning and climb a cold tree and let the wind blow across me. These, my guys, when I pastored, I'm not much of a hunter, but my guys took me hunting. And they even, they made me the man of honor. I didn't know that hunters had an honor code. And when I got out of the car, they said, Pastor, you're the man of honor here. And so they had me wear the cape. And it was an old deer's head with antlers. And they said, just walk, walk through the woods. You'll, you know, there's a, a bunch of other hunters did not honor that. Okay. Man, I'm telling you, bullets were flying everywhere. I, I tried to explain to my guys. I said, what, I, what should I do? They said, One guy said, run slower. I'm not sure what that meant. But what I'm telling you guys is you ought, to, you ought to have a time. Look, you ought to read your Bible every single day. I don't say you ought to study every day. But there ought to be a time when you do study. And you ought to be studying this book. You say, why? Because your God told you to. And you say you're going to do what God, you know, I, I can't get over people who go, tell me what you want me to do. And he told you right there, you're not doing that. Why would he believe you're going to do something else? So, study the Bible. Uh, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll look at the, 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 the <clears throat> it's not actually the second time, but I wanted to bring this one last just to upset you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, I'll tell you what happened. A number of years ago, I went into a pastor's house. And this, I think this, this la guy's last name was um, Mussolini or Hitler or Hussein. He was one of those guys, probably when he was dating his, his future wife in, in Bible college, the only word he ever said was, submit. I mean, that's what some guys do. You know, submit. And um, we walked into his house. And his wife was one of the sweetest Christian ladies you ever want to meet, and this guy was just, just really a, you know, I'm the head of my home. And you went into the kitchen, and every single cupboard door, wherever they were in the kitchen, had study to be quiet. So that she would study to be quiet. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And it says this. Verse 11, that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business. That's King James for mind your own business. And to work with your hands as we commanded you. Could somebody show me in that verse? I, I am absolutely completely open-minded on this. Could somebody show me that verse is directed at women? Because if that verse is directed at women, then the entire book of 1 Thessalonians is directed at women. And none of you believe that, do you? So what are you saying? I am saying that women are not told to study to be quiet. Men and women are told to study to be quiet. Now, you know why you, know why you have to study to be quiet? Because you don't know how to do it. Have you ever, have you ever been, I sit and, 
I, I love to sit in a gate at an airport and listen to somebody else's phone conversation from 50 feet away. Yeah, I saw that. No, yeah, I told him. And there's nobody. He didn't even hold the phone. He has to have some little thing in his ear. You know, it used to be people that walked down the street talking out loud, and there was no one around. We thought they were crazy. Now people walk down the street, and they're talking out loud. I still think they're crazy. I just go, we just go back to the default position. I think they're nuts. And some people just have to, you know, they just have to let you know. Do you ever notice that whenever some new thing that makes sound enters our society, everybody's got to get one. Does anybody remember when electric watches came and they had, they would, they would beep on the hour? All of us preachers got beep, 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 beep. <clears throat> and of course, keeping the scripture, I had a silencer. I was studying to be quiet. I'm telling you, I had a guy in my church <clears throat> at, at noon, the, the, the thing, I was in a church one time, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm preaching, and it hit 12 o'clock, and at 12 o'clock, a lady held her car keys up and went, now you don't want to know what I said, <laughs> but they haven't found her body yet. I just looked over, I said, lady, if you think that's going to get us out of here faster, I said, you should maybe put them away. But, but you know something, sometimes, you know, we've come to this point, we've come to this point in our society where if, if we went someplace and it's loud and boisterous and riotous, we had a good time. Uh, you know, we go to a restaurant, I like to go to restaurants, I like to celebrate the death of a cow, and so I'm having a steak, and, and, um, First off, it's very loud. I mean, every, the whole place is very, very loud. Uh, and everybody is, and it's not, it's not a drunken brawl. It's just everybody is loud. And then, the, and then they, they started a new deal where they had, the, at, at a certain sound, uh, every, all the waiters and waitresses lined up and did a line dance. Now, you say, oh, you got a conviction against that? No. I just want a quiet meal. I just wanted a quiet meal. I didn't want to sit in sound inside of a speaker. I've been in places where it's like the floor is tile, the ceiling is metal, the walls are tile, and, and when you walk in there, you can still hear what they said three days ago. <laughs> it's still bouncing around in there. Do you ever just want a nice, quiet meal? Okay, you know, some people are just loud. You say, well, yeah, I'm just loud. Well, then study to be quiet. Well, I don't know how to be quiet. That's right. So study. You know, sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes it's not even from talking loud to talking soft. Sometimes it's just shut up. And you won't believe this, but I actually practice that. There are times when I'm in a conversation, I think, hey. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I see what you mean. <clears throat> I just don't say it. You say, why? Well, I know this is going to be hard for you to believe, but not everybody needs to hear what you got to say. In fact, uh, and Lincoln got this. Lincoln got this from the Bible. But Abraham Lincoln said, it is better to remain silent, be thought a fool, than to speak up and remove all doubt. <laughs> the Bible says that even a fool, when he's quiet, is thought wise. So some of you would really look good if you... What, think about this. Okay, why are we told to be quiet? Why, are, why does the Bible tell us to study to be quiet? Uh, one of them, I think, is humility. You know what? You know what? If you shut up, if God tells you to shut up, if you ever do this, uh, you're, you're with a bunch of adults, and, and an eight-year-old thinks he's an adult, and starts intruding in the, in the, in the uh, you know, well, I like red marbles. And, um, and do you ever see the parents go, just go in the other room and play. This is the adults. Okay? You know, what the kid needs to find out is he's not the most important person in the building. The problem is the kid grows up and he turns into you. <laughs> and he turns into me. And we just think everybody has got to hear our opinion. I, I'm amazed. You know, the, the, if the internet has done anything, it has sanctified the opinion of every mouth-breathing imbecile on the planet. People go to blogs and Twitter and Facebook just to, I just want to let them know what I thought. 
No, you just want to let them know that you finally had one. I mean, you know, you have a thought once a year and you wanted it to, like, put it down in writing. It could be, you know, the file on you is like half a page on wise things you've said. Hey, you know, what's, you know what, what it means? It means if you're, if you're told to be quiet, there just might be something going on more important than you. And I know that's hard for you to believe. You know, and, and I'll be honest here, uh, the younger generation, they are the ones that have been told that they're champions. You know, when, uh, when President Obama took office, like right after he took office, he had the big bailout. And you guys heard about it. There were some corporate executives, guys, 30-something guys. And, and they got this money from the government to bail out their company. But they also had bonus checks that, that, that were owed them. And so they had enough money to bail out the company or to give themselves bonus checks, so they wrote out their, their bonus checks. Now, you say, do I think that's wrong? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's wrong. But I'm not critical of the guys that did that. You say, why? Because from this high, they were walking around with T-shirts said, it's all about me. When they were this big, their parents were saying, you're very important, and you're a champion, and, and you come first. You know, in some public schools, they're singing a song called, I am the most important person I know. So we've got an entire generation that thinks, I should be first. I've been told that all my life. So these guys that wrote themselves the bonus checks just did what they were told. To. They, they were told they were important, and they, and they think they're important. And when you are told, be quiet and let someone else speak, you know, I, was, uh, <clears throat> I took a phone call yesterday. I knew what it was. I've gotten them a thousand times. Oh, Dr. Kip, I've read a couple of your books, and I just have some questions. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't have any questions. He's gonna, he, he wants to uh, put it on me on the phone so he can tell his friends that, uh, you know, I put it on Sam Gip. And, and, and you, know, you know how it always ends up? It always ends up they talk over me. They will not let me. They ask me a question. They can't take the answer. They won't let me finish. You say, what do they need? They need to be quiet. Now, I did hook this guy. I gave him two scripture to look up. And if he thinks at all, he's going to look at those scripture. And he is going to be troubled today. He's not, he probably didn't look at him last night. He was still mad. But, um, but the fact is that when you, when you are quiet, it says there's somebody more important. Or there's something going on more important than you. Uh, sometimes it is a courtesy. Now, again, we have a generation that doesn't believe in courtesy. There is no courtesy, and, and I think it's just a courtesy to shut up. I, I believe this, guys. I believe when somebody's preaching, you do not interrupt. So, well, he's correct in the Bible. Then if you can't sit there and shut up, leave as quietly as you can. But don't stand up in a service and shoot your mouth off. Uh, I, was, uh, I was preaching in a church one time, and I said something, and a guy way in the back shot his mouth off. Now, here's what I do when that happens. <clears throat> I am a guest in every church I'm in. So this is not my church, this is the pastor's church, so that guy back there is interrupting a service at the pastor's church, so I figure the pastor's going to take care of this. And I looked at the pastor, and he's going, he looks like a chihuahua that had just barked. <laughs> and I looked at him, and I could see, this guy's not going to do anything. And I told the guy to be quiet, and he, and he kept on shooting off his mouth. Now, see, here's what I tell the pastor, you need to take care of this, because if I take care of it, lawyers will be involved. And so I came out of the pulpit, and the only thing I felt bad about was the guy was at the last pew, because I'd like him about four pews in, so that as I take him out, oh, excuse me, oh, excuse me. And <clears throat> I started out, I looked over, I thought I'd give him one more chance. I said, are you going to do anything about this? He goes, he, he didn't even look back, could you please be quiet? And they must have been brothers, because he listened. And it saved a big lawsuit. And they say, well, preacher, I don't think you ought to be that way. Don't interrupt a preacher. There's nothing you're saying that is more important than what a preacher's saying. I believe that. I believe when you're someplace and somebody's speaking, shut your mouth. Don't talk out loud. Don't talk to people during a service. You know, I, um, you know people say, do you, you get mad when people sleep in your church, in your services? I don't. I really don't. First off, there's two kinds of people that sleep. There's kids, kids. Man, I have parents come up and they go, our little you know, our little five-year-old fell asleep in the service. We're sorry. I said, oh, I, I, I'm telling you, I tell them, here's what I tell them. I love to see children sleep in church. You know why? Because you sleep where you feel safe. And I said, when a kid sleeps in church, he feels safe. And I look at the parents and I say, 
Now, don't you sleep. Because you won't be saved. You will close those eyes. A horrible thing will happen. <laughs> but um, I, and I know you're going to think this is crazy. I don't mind if they sleep as long as they don't snore. You say, what's wrong with snoring? Anything you do sitting in a pew that distracts attention from a pulpit, you are, you are quenching the spirit of God. Uh, let me tell you this. This needs to be said. When you come into church, turn off your cell phone. Oh, no, I put, I put it on vibrate. No. Put it on the bathroom cabinet and pick it up when you get home. Well, I might have, you, there's no call you're going to get that is more important than what goes on behind a pulpit. Well, I'm a first responder. Oh, so you're going to go save somebody's life? I just might save somebody's life. We might save their soul. Tell me which is more important. When that thing, and, and look, you have all done this. Have you not sit in a service and heard somebody's phone vibrate? And it attracted your attention, did it not? I was preaching in a, in a, in a church, <clears throat> and um, service went well. Had everybody stand up for the invitation, and as soon as they stood for the invitation, a cell phone went off. And so this guy, and he slips out of the sanctuary. As soon as he went out, before the invitation could be in, I'm almost, as soon as it happened, another cell phone went off. And, and that lady took hers and went out. And as soon as the doors closed, a third cell phone, I mean, went off one, two, three. And there were as many people at that altar as are at this one right now. It ran the Holy Spirit right out of the building. And I don't, I don't know how important those calls were, but I'm going to tell you, those calls had an eternal effect. And if somebody went to hell or God spoke to somebody's heart and, and they got distracted by that telephone, look, if you, here's why you don't want to disturb a service. You don't want to be to blame for somebody not taking care of business with God. And I believe you will answer for that. You will answer. Why would you want to do the devil's job? Why would you want to, why would you want to do something that's going to distract from the preaching? So I just think you ought to turn them off. I just shut them down. Um, one of the things about uh, uh, being quiet, did you ever notice if you're quiet, you hear something else? Did you know there just might be something you need to hear? I don't know. Maybe it's just the water leak in the basement. But sometimes, did you ever just say, oh, whoosh, whoosh. that sounds like a bomb ticking. Sometimes, you know, if you can study to be quiet, sometimes you just need to be quiet. Some of you ought to just sit down and say, I am not going to say anything. Do you ever meet those people? They have perfected speaking, breathing in, breathing out. They don't ever stop. I marvel. And men, it's not women. Men do it too. I marvel because these guys come up to me and they, go, and they will tell you everything. I'm, and I'm, and what I, they think I'm interested in the conversation. I'm not. In fact, what I'm doing is studying. How this guy went from one subject, he went through nine different subjects, and I was just watching how he just kind of segued from one to the other, and I was, I marvel. When, when I pastored a church, I had this lady, and she was one of those, I mean, she probably taught classes on how to speak and not breathe. You know you're in trouble when she get up on Wednesday night for a prayer, for a prayer request, and she started at her child's second diaper, and he's 35. And I mean, she, and, and I'm telling you the truth, she'd stand up and she's just going, and I'd look at my church, and if, honest guys, I think I, if I'd have said, let's kill her, <laughs> she'd have been dead before I could say, I was kidding, and so, but I was loving it, I was loving it, I'm just watching my people, they are in horrible pain, they are just in horrible pain, of the how's it feel, pal, anyway, so, and she's just, and she would just go, and one one Wednesday night, she actually did this. I cannot believe it. She's going, and then she just stopped. She went, and went off again. I, went, I almost went, she breathed. That was it for the month. She had this little kid. He was about this big, and he had Coke bottle glasses, and he would walk up to men. Men would be talking in the, in the aisles, uh, in, the, in the halls, and they'd go, why is he always looking at this? He's probably never seen a man talk. He doesn't know we can. Yeah, you My dad doesn't do that. <laughs> you know what sometimes you need to study to be quiet? 
I know this is hard for you to believe, but, but the world does not always need your opinion. Sometimes you would do well just to bite your tongue and not give your opinion. You do well. You would do well to not add something to the conversation. I'm not saying always do that, but it says that both men and women have to study to be quiet. And it is study. Uh, some of you ought to sit down and go, boy, you know, I'm, I'm always doing this, I'm always doing that. I need to find out how I can dial that in. I need where I, I need to, I need to, do I really need to say that? I'm telling you guys, I am always shooting my mouth off. I am always gone. And you'd be shocked how many times I have said nothing. And I've sat and I just said, I'm not going to engage here. They don't need to hear what I think. Uh, I don't need to one-up anybody. Uh, I don't need to impress anybody. Just shut up and listen, even if you think what they're saying is frivolous. You say, what does that do? It's study. You say, why is it important? Because it's in the Bible. You stop and think about it. In one place, it says study. There's only in there three times. Only one place. It's not talking about what you should study. It just says studies a, a weariness of the flesh, right? You're only admonished to study two things. The Bible and being quiet. Now, you, you, you think the Bible is important, right? You can understand God telling you to study the Bible, can't you? And this God that thought it was so important to tell you to study a book he wrote to you, thought it was so important to say, hey, could you also just shut up? Could you just study to be quiet? Do you understand the import of that word study in that verse when it only appears two times where we're told to study something and the, and the other one is the word of God? The thing that we put the highest premium we have, is that not true? That must tell us how important being quiet is. And we pass it by. Guys, I, I think you ought not slam books closed. I think you ought to be quiet the way you close the door. I don't think you ought to slam a door. I think you ought to close, I think you ought to turn the handle, pull it close quietly, say, why'd you do that? Because that book says stay to be quiet. Uh, I think you ought to zip your Bible closed quietly. Boy, that'll make a change in your church. Watch out, baby. I honestly, you know what I say, study? I have studied. I now this this Bible has a metal, this case has a metal zipper. The other one had a nylon one. And and when I close it, because I, I, you know, you throw your songbook down in the thing and make as much sound as you can. And I found that if I put my hand completely over it, I can close it pretty quiet as opposed to doing this. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Nothing. There's nothing wrong with slamming a Bible, uh, a, a, a songbook into the pew loudly. There's nothing wrong with slamming a door. It's not a sin. It's just not quiet. And we're told to study to be quiet. You say, why? Well, we might finally be a blessing. <laughs> so, study is a weariness of the flesh, but there's other things you study. There's other things you wear your flesh with. Isn't that true? Why wouldn't you wear your flesh with studying this? And why wouldn't you wear your flesh with studying to be quiet? Because that's the only two things God told you to study. So let's have a word of prayer. And um, I won't have a silent word of prayer. I will be that loud. But uh, we'll have a word of prayer and we'll take a break. Lord, there's nothing wrong with your Bible. And these people don't believe there's anything wrong with your Bible. These are Bible believers. God, they give you honor. They give you respect. They do believe you gave us a perfect book. God, they need to study this book. <clears throat> it's not that what they study is necessarily sin. It's just not going to get them past the grave. It's, they're going to leave it all behind, mostly. I, I pray, God, they'll be students of your book. And I pray, God, that we'll be students of quiet. Uh, our world has gotten louder and more riotous and more boisterous and more intrusive. And sometimes good just to be quiet. And so help us to learn to be quiet and help us to study your book. Help us to study the two subjects that you, you gave us a biblical mandate to study. And help us not to be delinquent in one and fervent in the other. Help us to study the Bible and study to be quiet because you told us to. In Jesus Christ's name we pray.